A very good afternoon to all. I C A Pankaj Kasat on behalf of K S C A A welcome you all for today's webinar on deduction under A T P for cooperative societies and its litigation matter. Before we begin, let me brief you about K S C A. K S C A was formed in the year 1957, regularly conducting seminars, webinar, conferences, workshops, study circle meetings for profit of professional interest for its members. It represents concerns, issues, and suggestions of CA fraternity and businesses to various governmental agencies and regularities. Any association derives its value and power from the members associated with it. KSCAA welcome you to be part of 3,200 plus strong tribe. Online registration link for lifetime membership can be found on www.kscaa.com. To speak on today's webinar. We have an eminent speaker, C. A. Prakash, C. A. Prakash Hegde, sir, from Bangalore, Bangalore. Welcome you, sir. Thank you. I also welcome C. A. Kumar Jigjini, sir, President K. S. C. A. A. I also welcome C. A. Siddesh Gitti, sir, Chairman D. T. Committee K. S. C. A. A. Now I also welcome today's attendees for today's webinar. Let me just brief today's attendee about technical aspect of this webinar. There is a Q and A option on your screen where you can write your questions related to today's webinar, and our moderator will take your questions at the end of the session. Now I would like to hand over to C A Balaji sir to introduce today's speaker, C A Prakash Hegde sir. Thank you, Pankaj sir. It's my pleasure to introduce C A Prakash Hegde today's speaker. Prakash sir graduated in commerce, become and law LLB special. He holds a master's in business administration. He is also a fellow of the ICAI. ICAI. He was a university topper, both in become by securing a second rank and LLB by having a gold medal. Prakash sir initially worked with a cooperative giant, the Thotagars Cooperative Sales Society Limited (CSC) as its CEO. Later, he worked with Price Water Coopers uh, in the field of direct and international taxation. Subsequently, he worked as a director with Deloitte, Askinsons, and Sales. Now he is in practice. Prakash has advised many leading Indian and multinational business houses on a wide variety of matters covering taxation of cooperative societies, personal taxation, corporate taxation, expatriate taxation, international taxation, etc. He also has rich experience in dealing with direct tax compliance, advisory, and litigation. Many articles authored by him on income tax are published in many journals and newspapers. He has argued several important income tax cases before the income tax tribunals. Now, I like to present Prakash sir to you. Thanks, Balaji. Hi. Good evening, everybody. For the next few minutes, let us discuss the deductions under Section ATP of the Income Tax Act and litigation. The uh, first and foremost aspect is about the deductions. Let us have a look at certain basic aspects and then let us look at the litigation aspects. The agenda has been classified like this. First, let us have a brief background for a layman's understanding, even for the people who do not have much background about the cooperative societies. Then let us briefly discuss about types of cooperative societies, then the important provisions of the Income Tax Act. Thereafter, the main core discussion, that is issues and discussion regarding the various litigation aspects. 
some basic suggestions about assessment and appeal and later we will have your questions you can continue to write your questions in the chat box so if we stop some time let us have a look at those questions or we can take it up at the end of the discussion A brief background just for a layman's understanding of what is taxation of corporate societies. Let's just have a look at it. See, generally, under the Indian Income Tax Act, every type of income will fall under one of the heads of income. There may be some types of exempt incomes, but the income will fall into a particular category and we will arrive at the gross total income. Similarly, for a cooperative society also, we arrive at the gross total income and from the gross total income subject to certain conditions a deduction under section ATP will be granted in the case of a cooperative society. This deduction is not applicable for a cooperative bank. So please keep in mind only a cooperative society is entitled for deduction under section ATP and a cooperative bank is not and cooperative society to be eligible for the deduction has to fulfill certain conditions. With this, let us just check what are the usual types of cooperative societies we find. We can classify the common types of cooperative societies on the basis of registration or on the basis of functions. First, let us have a look at what are the classifications based on the registration. Please note that the discussion is centered around the societies in Karnataka only. We are not going to touch the aspects or the various decisions of other courts or tribunals, etc. unless they are relevant for the Karnataka cooperative societies. So from the Karnataka cooperative societies perspective, there can be three types of cooperative societies. One, which are registered under the Central Cooperative Societies Act 1912. The second one is under the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act and the third one is Karnataka Savarda Sarkari Act. Further, based on the functions of each of the cooperative societies, a society may be classified under different categories. I have just given some examples. The first one is Primary Agricultural Credit Cooperative Society, which deals with mainly the agricultural credit, agricultural financing, etc. To its members. The second category is Agricultural and Rural Development Bank. The third one is a credit cooperative society, a marketing cooperative society, multi-purpose cooperative society, bank, etc. etc. instance, there could be unlimited types of cooperative societies. Say for example, Weavers Cooperative Society, Employees Cooperative Society, uh, Horticulture Cooperative Society, Fruits and Vegetables Cooperative Societies, so there could be n number of cooperative societies, but for the purpose of our discussion, particularly from the income tax perspective, we would be focusing on the categories which are mentioned here. Let us have a quick look at the provisions of the Income Tax Act, because it's essential that we just have a look at a brief introduction to the various provisions of the Act and then we get into the litigation matters. The first and prominent aspect of the Income Tax Act that I need to highlight is a, an amendment which has been introduced with effect from assessment year 2018-19, which says that deduction under section 80H to 80TT is not available unless the return is filed within the due date specified in section 139-1. So if a society has delayed the filing of the tax return, then it is not entitled for deduction under section ATP. This has come into force with effect from 2018-19. Now coming to section ATP of the Income Tax Act, section ATP has four limbs, ATP 1, ATP 2, ATP 3, and ATP 4. The first part discusses that the 
deduction under section ATP would be available if the conditions under ATP2 are fulfilled. Let us see what are the conditions under ATP2. The first limb under ATP2 is ATP2A and ATP2A has seven subclasses. Let us look at each of these classes. ATP2A says the whole of the profits and gains of business attributable to the following activities would be subject to deduction. Here, please have a look at the word attributable, which I have highlighted. Attributable means something which is more than derived from. The alternative term which could have been used here is derived from. If a particular society is eligible for deduction for the income which it has received or which, which it has received from the activities which are derived from a particular function, then it is a restrictive meaning. But when we say it is attributable to given activities, then not only the given activities, but any subsidiary or ancillary activities which go together with those main activities are also coming under the purview of section ATP. So it, is, it gives a wide meaning. Under ATP2A, the first limb deals with the carrying on of business of banking or providing credit facilities to its members. Here, carrying on the business of banking or providing credit facilities have not been defined and this has been subjected to litigation. The word banking generally derives the meaning from the Banking Regulation Act. So a society to carry on the banking activities should generally be registered under the Banking Regulation Act with the Reserve Bank of India and will be governed under the RBI provisions. Providing credit facilities is also not defined. So here a general meaning is taken to say that a society which provides the credit facilities for the benefits of members will be eligible for it. So each of the words here is very important. See, it says its members. So if a cooperative society is giving credit facilities to somebody who is not a member, then such income is not subject to deduction under section ATP 2A. The next limb, class 2, deals with cottage industry. Cottage industry is also not defined in the Income Tax Act. In case of disputes, the courts have referred to the Industrial Development and Regulation Act wherein cottage industries have been classified. In some of the cases, the income tax officers took a view that cottage industry should be a very small industry and if it is a very big industry, then it does not fall within the definition of cottage industry. But the courts have held that cottage industry is a word which has been used in Section ATP and the size and the number of employees, etc. are not defined. So whatever be the size of the industry, if it is a cottage industry, then it is eligible for Section ATP deduction. The next one is the marketing of agriculture produces grown by its members. Here, marketing is also not defined. What is marketing? Whether getting the producers to the market and showing it to the prospective buyers is only the activities what we refer to as marketing is a question which came before Karnataka High Court in the case of Rights Agricultural Produce Cooperative Marketing Society in 1978. Because while giving a deduction under Section ATP or for that matter for any section, whether it is an exemption or a deduction, the income tax department will have some objection, right? So one needs to understand what is the meaning of marketing to be clear so that a particular society will be eligible for a deduction under Section ATP. In the decision of Rights Agricultural Produce Cooperative Marketing Society, which was uh, the decision of Justice Venkta Chalaya, the famous Venkta Chalaya, he says marketing is not just bringing the producers, it includes grading, standardization, transportation, finance, market intelligence, everything. So marketing is a very wide word which covers many activities. So if a society has been doing any of these activities for the purpose of 
marketing agriculture producers grown by its members, then it is entitled for the deduction. Again, produce has not been defined. What is an agricultural produce? Whether, say, for example, sugar is a, an agricultural produce, a cooperative society purchases sugar cane from its members and it manufactures sugar out of sugar cane. Whether the agriculture, whether the sugar which has been manufactured by the society can be called as agriculture produce was the question in one of the cases. The Kerala High Court decided that the agricultural produce has to remain as an agricultural produce. If it takes the color of a manufactured produce, then it will not be entitled for deduction under section 80p. Here, there is one more decision of the Karnataka High Court in the same rights agricultural produce cooperative society in 1978 decision, where the court held that if paddy has been dehusked and rice is produced out of the paddy, rice will still remain an agriculture produce because it has not changed to become a manufactured produce. Therefore, paddy or rice, both will be considered as agriculture produce. Then the other keyword is grown by its members. If a buyer of a particular produce, agriculture produce, buys, and if he qualifies to be a member of a cooperative society, and if he sells that producers through the cooperative society, the cooperative society is not entitled for ATP deduction for the portion of the profit which it has earned because of that particular transaction. So, to qualify to get deduction under Section 80P, the society has to ensure that the producers which are sold through it are grown by its members and not procured or purchased by the members. In many of the cases, we generally see that the members of the cooperative society buy the producers of other members and they bring it for marketing and the society try to claim ATP deduction. We need to be cautious. The fourth limb of Section 80 PA deals with purchase of agriculture implements, seeds, livestock, or other articles intended for agriculture for the purpose of supplying them to its members. Each of these conditions is very important. See, here it says supplying them to its members. If it is supplying to an outside distributor or to a non-member, the society is not entitled for deduction for the income which it earns out of such an activity. So, each of the conditions have to be cumulatively fulfilled. The fifth limb discusses processing agricultural produce of its members without the aid of power. Just a while ago, while discussing the marketing activity, I mentioned that processing of agricultural produce can also be considered as marketing based on the Karnataka High Court decision of 1978. Here is a case where processing of agriculture produce of its members without aid of power is included. So, if a society is in the activity of processing agriculture produce without the aid of power, then it can claim the deduction under this particular limb. But if it is actually marketing along with processing with or without the aid of power, I feel it should be eligible for deduction under the previous clause what we discussed. That's number three, the marketing of agricultural produce. The sixth term discusses about collective disposal of labor of its members. This is with regard to a labor cooperative society. The next one is fishing and allied activities. Now, coming to the next part of section 80p2, class B. Here, the provisions of the Income Tax Act discuss the deduction available for cooperative societies supplying milk, oil seeds, fruits or vegetables raised or grown by its members. Here again, see that it should be raised or grown by its members. If it is purchased by the members and sold to the cooperative society, the same is not entitled for deduction under Section 80p. The further condition is that the society should have collected or should have been engaged in the activity and it should be supplying it to a federal cooperative society or the government or a local body or a government company or a corporation, etc. They have defined to whom all it can be sold. So, if it collects 
this milk oil seeds or fruits etc and supplies to some third party or a commercial person then it is not entitled for the deduction most of the milk cooperative societies in karnataka collect the milk from the members and they supply it to federal cooperative society kmf or other cooperative societies so most of this how milk societies get covered under this now coming to the next limb of section atp2 that's part c this discusses deduction general deduction in the case of a society which is not getting the deduction under section atp2a or atp2b that's what we discussed until now still the society is entitled for a general deduction if it is a consumers cooperative society the general deduction is limited to rupees 1 lakh in the case of other societies the deduction is limited to 50000 i need to highlight that the deduction what the society is entitled for cannot exceed the gross total income of the society in any case so it will be either 1 lakh or gross total income whichever is less or 50000 and gross total income whichever is less similar is the case with deduction under section atp as a whole it cannot exceed gross total income the next limb is part d this discusses the income by way of interest or dividends of the cooperative society in case such amount of interest or dividend is received by its investments with any other cooperative society see the language used here they are saying if a cooperative society has earned any interest or dividend from its investments with any other cooperative society so if it invests in some banks commercial banks or if we uh, into invest into an nbfc or with a partnership firm or with a private individual it is not entitled for such kind of a deduction it is entitled for deduction only if it is another cooperative society this is also a matter of high litigation we will discuss that soon the next part discuss about income from letting of godowns or warehouses here just a couple of days back i was discussing this issue with one of my senior friends the case was like this it is a cooperative society and it has a cold storage and it has let out the cold storage to somebody and it has been collecting the rent whether letting of the cold storage can be considered as letting of godowns or warehouses for the purpose of deduction under section 80p was the question there is a decision of allahabad high court which says that even if a cold storage has been let out it should be considered as part of letting of the godown or the cold storage itself should be considered as a warehouse therefore the deduction should be available next part is atp3 atp3 states that double deduction is not available when other sections like ath etc which have been mentioned in chapter 6a are applicable so nobody is entitled for double deduction the next limb discusses the applicability of deduction for a cooperative bank it very clearly says the provisions of this section shall not apply in relation to any cooperative bank of course this there is a relaxation if the society is a primary agricultural credit society or a primary cooperative agricultural and rural development bank the deduction is still available this clause has been introduced from 2006 and this also has been a matter of litigation now let us proceed to the next stage of discussion important issues of litigation i have classified the main issues into several categories there could be more but i decided to focus on some of the very relevant and important issues so i have classified all the issues into 14 categories the first one is disputes with regard to sauharda cooperative the second one is interest received from commercial banks the third one is interest received from cooperative banks the fourth one is nominal members the disputes with regard to the membership category the next one is associate members 
sixth one is filing of return by the due date seventh one is deduction for expenses under section 57 eighth one is mutuality ninth one is deduction for unexplained cash credit next one is demonetization deposits the next one is dissolvency of mandatory deduction twelfth one is interest on income tax refunds next one is deduction for 40a 1a additions or such other additions last one is dissolvency to credit societies under section 80p4 so these are the important issues that we would be discussing in the next few minutes now let us take up the first issue regarding sauharda cooperative in the beginning of the discussion we discussed that a cooperative may be registered under the sauharda cooperative societies act or it may be registered under the karnataka cooperative societies act or under the Central Cooperative Societies Act of 1912. Let us see whether a Sauharda cooperative qualifies to be a cooperative society for the purpose of Income Tax Act. In the Income Tax Act, there is a definition of cooperative society. Let us have a look at what it says. Section 219 says, a cooperative society means a society registered under the cooperative societies act 1912 or under any other law for the time being in force in any state for the registration of cooperative societies see the language that has been used here a cooperative society means a cooperative society i have highlighted the word society and secondly in the second part for the registration of cooperative societies interestingly the Sahakari Act does not use the word society. It uses the organization as cooperative. Under the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act, the term which has been used is a cooperative society, whereas under the Savarda Sahakari Act, it is cooperative. So it is not a society in the strict literal sense of the word. This aspect was a matter of discussion in Udaya Savarda Credit Cooperative Limited in 2018 before the Bangalore Tribunal. The argument against the SSC was cooperative is different and cooperative society is different. The deduction under Section 80P under the Income Tax Act is meant only for cooperative society and not for a cooperative. A cooperative society is different and a cooperative is different that was the argument against the SSC whereas argument for the SSC was that though enactments are different purpose is the same the purpose of a server the cooperative was just to keep the interference of the government away to make it an independent body an economic body so that the interest of the members can be safeguarded and it should be self-reliant that was the purpose of a cooperative server and even the rate of tax applicable for a cooperative society and a cooperative are the same. Department did never raise any objections since the start of this cooperative cooperatives under the Savarda Saukari until 2018. Because Savarda Cooperative Societies Act was enacted in 1997 and many of the societies started getting registration from 2000 onwards. So until 2018, the department did never raise the objection. Only in 2018 it raised the objection, and such objection should not be considered was the argument of the SSC. The Udaya Savarda Credit Cooperative Society was the SSC in this particular case. Bangalore ITIT restored the matter back to the file of the AO, but the remark made by the Udaya by the ITIT was mainly that cooperative might not be considered as a cooperative society. Therefore, a Savarda Cooperative Society should not be entitled for a deduction under Section 80P, though it was not ruled, that was the inclination of the bench at that time while it passed the order. This matter went before the High Court of Karnataka in the case of Swabhimani Savarda Credit Cooperative Limited. It was in January 2020. Here, again, the matter was argued that cooperation was the primary focus of Savarda cooperative it is similar to cooperative society just because a society is not 
the core word which has been used and only the word cooperative has been used this should not be enti this entitled for deduction under atp absence of word society is not detrimental that was the argument the high court of karnataka accepted the argument and it said that the sauharda spirit of the sauharda cooperative is to maintain cooperation among the members so it should be considered as a cooperative society for the purpose of section atp so a favorable decision has been rendered despite this decision many of the income tax officers have been passing the orders against ssc the argument of the income tax authorities is that the matter is lying before the divisional bench of the karnataka high court and it is yet to be heard therefore the department still believes that a sauharda sarkari is not a cooperative society it is only a cooperative not entitled for benefit so the dispute goes on in case of any such disputes you can refer to this swabhimani sauharda credit society's decision and if the assessing officer has not granted you the deduction applied this particular decision in that case you can go in appeal at least the commissioner will accept this decision because it's the decision of the high court and he has to agree with the decision of the high court the next issue is an interesting and an exhaustive issue interest received from commercial banks the question is whether interest received from banks is income from business or income from other sources until 2010 all the cooperative societies were categorizing interest received from banks as income from business and it was never considered to be income from other sources in the case of the todkas cooperative the supreme court held it to be otherwise let us just have a look at the facts of the case the todkas cooperative society which is based out of sirsi in karnataka is a multi purpose cooperative society it provides credit facilities to its members it also markets the agricultural producers of its members the main agricultural producers are peanut pepper cardamom etc it is also into the activity of running a hotel running a supermarket and there are several other activities so it's a multi purpose cooperative society based on the factual analysis it was concluded by the supreme court that the funds which were used by the cooperative for the purpose of depositing with a commercial bank was out of the funds which were lying with the society which belonged to the members see how it happens is when the todka society collects the agriculture producers from the members the buyers of various producers come and buy the producers and they will pay the amount to the cooperative society and the todka society would pay to the members many of the members will not collect the money belonging to them and that would be lying with the cooperative society for quite some time in order not to keep the funds idle the todka cooperative society would invest that amount in commercial banks and it was a short term investment interest was earned out of such investment and this amount of interest which was earned by the todka society was in dispute the supreme court held that the core activity of todka society is marketing of the producers so any income which has been earned by way of marketing of the agriculture producers should definitely fall within the purview of income from business or profession but the surplus which is lying with the todka society which is belonging to the members which should have been withdrawn by the members is a liability of the society and it is not the funds of the society therefore the interest which has been earned out of such funds should be considered as other business activity and not the core business activity such other business activity means the interest should come under the head income from other sources and not under the head income from business or profession a while ago we have seen that to get the deduction under section 80p the income has to fall under the head income from business or profession if it falls under the head income from other sources deduction under section 80p 2a is not available therefore in this particular case the supreme court 
decided the matter against Thodgat's Cooperative Society and has held that the interest income which has been earned is not subject to deduction under Section 80P because such interest does not fall under the head income from business or profession. As soon as this decision came to light, the Income Tax Department used this as a very strong weapon in its armory and started issuing notice to all the cooperative societies and it considered whatever the interest that has been earned from any bank to be income from other sources and started denying deduction under Section 80P. Sometime during 2011-12, there are quite a number of cases. And one of the decisions of Karnataka High Court, wherein Totadar's decision was distinguished is the Tumkur Merchants Savarda Credit Cooperative Society Limited. In October 2014, the decision was delivered. Here, the facts are slightly different compared to the facts of the Totadar Society. Savarda Credit Cooperative Society, as the name itself suggests, this is a credit cooperative society engaged in providing credit facilities to its members. This was the only business of the SSC. The SSC had deposited idle funds with banks for short term and earned interest. Here, the Karnataka High Court distinguished the facts of the Totgars, wherein in the Totgars case, the funds of the members were lying with the society which was utilized for the purpose of investment into commercial banks and interest was earned out of that. But here, the funds belong to the society and also the funds were idle and the society is a cooperative, credit cooperative society and moreover, the word which has been used in section ATP was attributable. Attributable was given a wider meaning. As I mentioned a while ago, the term which has been used is not derived from. Derived from is not used here. It's attributable. So it gives a wider meaning. Therefore, any amount of interest which has been earned by the cooperative society in this particular case from the commercial bank should also be considered as income from business was the conclusion of the Karnataka High Court. And the same view was taken by the Karnataka High Court in the case of Guttige Darda Credit Cooperative Society, June 2015. So this is considered as a very landmark decision, particularly in the case of credit cooperative societies. This decision drew a difference between marketing societies and credit cooperative society. Society which has the funds of its members, repayable to the members, and society which has its own funds, which are not repayable to the members. Society which is entitled for benefit under Section ATP and society which is not entitled for Section ATP benefit. So thus the distinction was drawn. And based on this decision, quite a few subsequent decisions came. The prominent one among them is Honnadi Credit Cooperative Society. This is a credit cooperative society relying on the decision of Tumkur merchants the ITAT, Bangalore ITAT, delivered the decision in favor of the SSC. So, what are the key takeaways from here? I have given in the form of notes. See, when you come across a situation where a cooperative society has earned interest from banks, it may be commercial banks or it may be from the district central cooperative banks or other cooperative banks, you need to check the financial details in the submissions and you have to give the summary of the financial details. Also, you have to summarize the balance sheet and try to convince the assessing officer that the amount what has been utilized for the purpose of investment into the commercial banks is out of the funds of the cooperative society that's out of its own funds and not the borrowed funds. You should try to make a distinction between Todgar society and your society. Also, the other line of defense is to claim the deduction under section 80P2A1 as well as under section 80P2D. There is a controversy for deduction under section 80P2D. We will come to that later. But when you have to make the claim, claim both under 80P2A1 as well as under 80P2D so that in the future, depending on the status of the various cases, it will help you for the purpose of argument at the appellate stage. Further, 
you can also make an alternative claim for deduction of cost of funds. Assume that the assessing officer or the appellate authorities do not consider that your society has earned interest which falls under the head income from business or profession, then it will consider that the interest has come under the head income from other sources. In such a case, you will be entitled for deduction of cost of funds under section 57. So you have to make an alternative claim at the assessment stage itself, it will be easier. Interest received from cooperative banks. This is the third issue that I would like to discuss. Now, with regard to the provisions of section ATP 2D, we have already seen the particular section subclause provides deduction to interest or dividend from investments with any other cooperative society. So, what is the definition of other cooperative society? It was commonly understood that any other cooperative society means a society which has been registered under the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act or Savarda Sahakari Act, but it might have also been registered under the Banking Regulation Act. That was the common understanding. Accordingly, all the organizations, cooperative societies, which have been receiving interest from cooperative banks considered such interest for the purpose of deduction under section ATP 2D. But in the case of, also in the case of Karnataka High Court, in the case of Thotgars, the Karnataka High Court Divisional Bench in 2017 January said that cooperative society is a genus, whereas cooperative bank is a species. In other words, cooperative society is a bigger family and cooperative bank is a member amongst them. To qualify to be a cooperative bank, a cooperative that bank has to first qualify to be a cooperative society. So, cooperative bank has to get registered under the reserve bank provisions also. Therefore, here you can see the diagram which has been put. A cooperative society is a category. Cooperative bank falls into the category of cooperative society as well as a bank. In other words, cooperative bank is a society was the decision of the High Court of Karnataka in January 2017. Very soon, in the same matter of Totgas Cooperative Sales Society, just in five months, that's instead of January 2000, in June 2017, another batch of cases came before the same bench of High Court of Karnataka, that's Darwad bench, <clears throat> wherein the judges took a different view for the same matter. They took a view, cooperative society is a different category, cooperative bank is of a different category, and for that purpose, cooperative bank has been denied ADP deduction. 194A provisions are applicable only to a cooperative bank. Therefore, cooperative society should not get, get covered under the definition of cooperative bank. That was the interpretation of the Karnataka High Court Divisional Bench in the case of Totaka Society only, just in about five months' time. Therefore, the question again remained whether ATP 2D is applicable for interest or dividend from investments with cooperative bank. The High Court of Karnataka ruled against the Totaka Society in this particular case. However, the uh, experts in this jurisprudence say that when a divisional bench is differing from the view of a previous divisional bench, such difference of opinion should be referred to a full bench with at least three judges. And it should not happen that one divisional bench contradicts the view of another divisional bench. But here that's what happened. Now the matter is before the Supreme Court. Until this matter gets resolved before the Supreme Court, all the other cooperative societies have to accept the but burn. Let us have a look at the discussion on these two decisions. In the case of the same SSC, before the same high court, before the same bench, before the same strength of the bench, different views have been given. One way of arguing it is saying that the word which has been used in section ATP 4 denying the deduction to a cooperative bank is 
in relation to any cooperative bank so how the judges interpreted it is cooperative bank is disentitled from deduction under section atp and also any interest or dividend paid by such cooperative bank to any other cooperative society is also disentitled from deduction under section atp because the word that has been used is in relation to any cooperative bank so whether the income is earned by the cooperative bank or whether the income is given by the cooperative bank such income should not be subject to deduction was the interpretation of the judge dr vinit kothari who was the heading this particular bench was also a chartered accountant i need to mention that so in his view cooperative bank is not a cooperative society now the challenge before us is when we go for assessment or appeals in the case of other societies this decision is coming as a hindrance for us to claim the adp deduction one of the arguments that we have been making is if there are two contradictory decisions of the same bench the one favoring the assessee should be applied this view was upheld by delhi itit special bench in virit investments private limited june 2017 the context was different in that uh, delhi itit decision but this is the ratio of the decision which has been held so this is one of the arguments also we are raising an alternative claim of deduction for cost of funds for the interest what has been earned from such cooperative bank Uh, my dear friends from KCIA, I would like to know whether I need to take up any questions here. Sir, yes, sir. There are a few questions, sir. If you want, I'll read it out. Yeah, we can take it up. Yes, sir. So the first question is dealing with uh, citizen cooperative decision. Maybe we can park it uh, for some time. Sir, I'll consider yes. the questions which are relevant to the topics which are already discussed. Uh, please explain distinguishing factors Tumkur grain merchants versus Todgars, so which is already taken care, sir. Yeah. In most cases, assessment orders for assessment year 1819, EO treated the FT interest income received from other cooperative societies as income from other sources and taxed the interest income fully. Is it correct? So also discussed. Sir, if uh, credit cooperative society has earned interest on investment of temporary surplus of funds, including members' deposit, will Todgar's decision apply? Earned interest on investment of temporary surplus of funds, sir. The question is whether the temporary funds are the funds belonging to that cooperative society or is it a borrowed fund? If we have to follow the decision of Tumkur Merchants Savarda Sahakari. So personally, I am of the view, irrespective of the source of funds, irrespective of whether the amount has been invested with the commercial bank or with a cooperative bank, a credit cooperative should be entitled for deduction under section 80P2A1 because it is into the business of providing credit facilities to its members. So when we say the income which is attributable to the activities of providing credit facilities to its members, not only the interest which has been earned by that cooperative society from its members, but also the interest which has been earned in that business activity is considered as attributable. Therefore, ATP 2A1 should be applicable in such case. But however, because of the restrictions of the case laws now, which are hanging around in different shapes and forms, we have to be mindful while representing before the assessment authorities or the appellate authorities, to the extent possible, we need to go applying the provisions of the decisions. <clears throat> what does this decision say is, if the fund is belonging to the cooperative, then such amount of interest should be considered as income from business. If the funds are belonging to the members, in such a case, the total decision will be applicable, then the interest should be considered as income from other sources. 
even if you consider it as income from other sources you should make a claim for deduction under section 57 for the cost of funds i hope that answers yes sir thank you sir sir uh, follow on question on this particular issue itself sir uh, with respect to fluid resources which are required to be maintained will the position still remains the same uh, we will come to that sure sir so the last question sir uh, recently in the faceless assessment orders the assessing officers are disallowing entire deduction under atp 2a by relying upon third gas even on reference to the latest judgment so this is uh, associate members versus nominal members sir. Should we consider or we'll park it? Sir? We'll take it up later. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Now, one other aspect which I need to mention here is a recent decision of Karnataka, sorry, Bangalore ITIT. In the case of Karnataka State Cooperative Federation, it has slightly distinguished the decision of Totgas of June 2017 and has held that. SSC should be eligible for deduction under section 80p2d for the interest received by it from cooperative banks also. This comes as a silver lining in the clouds, but the discussion in the judgment is quite limited, so I am unable to comment much on this. We need to wait and watch how the tribunals and the high courts or the Supreme Court will consider this aspect. Let's move further. Some societies are required to maintain deposit of reserve fund and also reserves, certain kinds of liquid reserves, etc., in specified modes of investments. One of the examples is Rule 23 of the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Rules and Section 58 of the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act. Here, the Bangalore ITAT has delivered a beautiful judgment in September 2015, which says that. In the case of Chitradurga City Multipurpose Cooperative Society, which says that interest received from statutory reserves should be considered as income from business and therefore eligible for deduction under Section 80P2A1. I just want to remind you that this decision also refers to Tumkur Merchants Cooperative Bank and the, uh, the um, reason for this kind of a decision given by ITIT Bangalore is Statutory reserves are nothing but the funds belonging to the cooperative society and it is not the liability of the society which has to be say paid back to the members or to outsiders. It is the amount belonging to the society. Therefore, it should be entitled for deduction under section 80p2a1. There are few controversies around the meaning of members. What is the definition of member has been a controversial aspect. We have seen in the context of section ATP A, ATP 2A, that in case a cooperative society is providing credit facilities to its members, its, its income is entitled for deduction under section ATP 2A1. In case a cooperative society is societies in the business of providing marketing facilities to its members, then it is entitled for deduction under section 80p to A3. Here, the highlight has been members. So, the facility or the activity should have been provided to that member. The service should have been provided to such member. But who is a member? Whether a member can be just a member who has signed the at the time of registration of the societies or whether he is a shareholder member, whether it can be a nominal member or an associate member or a sympathizer member has been a matter of dispute. The definition of member is not provided in the Income Tax Act. In this regard, sometime back in 2002, CBDT issued a circular in the context of tax deduction at source for the interest to be paid by the banks, etc. In the CBDT circular, the CBDT mentioned that nominal members will not be considered as regular members and it tried to distinguish between these two categories of membership. And this was questioned by Jalgaon District Central Cooperative Bank. 
before the Bombay High Court by way of writ petition. The Bombay High Court held that such a distinction is not permissible because the, when the act says it's a member, it could be nominal member or it could be share member or a sympathizer member or an associate member. The distinction has not been made by the act. CBDT circular cannot bring in the distinction was the view of the Bombay High Court in that particular case. So thereafter, again, the uh, courts and the appellate authorities, assessing of authorities, everybody was accepting a view that nominal member and associate members should also be considered as members for the purpose of granting deduction under section 80p2a1. This issue came up before the Supreme Court once again in August 2017. Here, it's the matter of citizen cooperative society. <clears throat> citizen cooperative society is a cooperative society based out of Andhra Pradesh and registered under the Mutually Aided Cooperative Societies Act. Mutually Aided Cooperative Societies Act considered only one kind of membership, that is regular share membership. It did not recognize nominal membership or associate membership. So, as per that particular act, this society was supposed to deal with only the share members or regular members. But unfortunately, Citizen Cooperative Society, through its bylaws, rolled out another class of members called nominal members, and it started enrolling many people as nominal members, and it started conducting business with such members. The assessing officer took a view that such nominal members are not in accordance with the Mutually Aided Cooperative Societies Act, and therefore, such nominal members should not be considered as members of the society for the purpose of Section 80P, and therefore, the deduction under Section 80P is not available. The matter traveled to all the appellate authorities and finally reached the bench of the Supreme Court. <laughs> the Supreme Court upheld the view of the assessing officer only for the reason that Mutually Aided Cooperative Societies Act does not recognize nominal membership. Therefore, if a society is calling certain people as nominal members, they do not qualify to be members because they are not recognized by the Societies Act. That was the ruling of the Supreme Court in Citizens. <clears throat> Thereafter, immediately, this became another weapon in the armory of the assessing officers they started issuing notice to all the societies stating that if you have the nominal membership, then give the details, then we will not allow ATP deduction. However, the fact which was forgotten by the income tax authorities was, in the case of the citizens cooperative, the applicable law was mutually aided cooperative societies act. But in the other cases in Karnataka, the applicable law was Karnataka cooperative societies act and Sauharda Sahakari act wherein nominal membership is given equal weightage under the definition of member. Therefore, the experts started drawing the distinction between the two acts, applicability of the view that nominal members are not member was not accepted by the experts. <laughs> now, <clears throat> thereafter, there were quite a few decisions of Karnataka Tribunal and also one um, by the Madras High Court in the case of Amma Pet Cooperative Society, wherein Madras High Court very clearly held that if a particular Cooperative Societies Act considers nominal member to be its member, then for the income tax purposes, that member should be considered as a member and the income arising out of dealing with such members should be eligible for ATP deduction in the case of Amma Pet by Madras High Court. <clears throat> Further, in January 2021, the Supreme Court had to analyze this particular aspect in the case of Mavilavi Service Cooperative Bank Limited, which is a cooperative society, though the name is given as bank, it is actually a society registered under the Kerala Cooperative Societies Act. As far as the definition of member is concerned, Kerala Cooperative Societies Act and Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act stand on the same footing. Both have defined in the same terms. Both say that nominal member is also a member. In this case of Mumilai, Supreme Court held that definition as stated in the particular act applicable to the Cooperative Societies Act should be followed. The Income Tax Act has not defined the word member, 
Therefore, the definition in the political societies act should be followed. This view has also been endorsed by Bangalore ITIT judgment in Vasavi Credit Cooperative Society, January 2021. For the purpose of ease of reference, I have reproduced the definition of member under the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act and Karnataka Savardha Sakari Act. I'll read it out. Under the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act, member means a person joining in the application for the registration of a cooperative society and a person admitted to membership after such registration in accordance with this act, the rules and the bylaws and includes a nominal member and an associate member. So here it includes a nominal member and an associate member. Whereas in the case of Karnataka Savardha Sarkari Act, the wordings are almost the same. Only missing definition is with regard to associate member. In the case here, it says includes a nominal member and gives a full stop. It does not include an associate member because under the Savar the Sarkari Act, associate membership is not considered. Therefore, following the decision of the Madras High Court in Amma Pet or the uh, decision of the Supreme Court in Mavilai or the decision of citizens in the by the Supreme Court, the view is that the definition of member should be restricted to the definition as given in the particular act which is applicable and should not be stretched beyond that. There was a question with regard to citizens cooperative, if you could just read it, Balaji or Siddesh. Yes, sir. Sir, apparently in the faceless proceedings for assessment year 1819, uh, the assessing officers are relying upon Todgars, despite the fact that uh, Mavalia's services are uh, in favor of Assasi. So the querist is asking, what is your view? And the denial of the deduction is on the ground of dealing with non nominal members. Uh, other ground is mutuality. The society is allowed to deal with members and non nominal members. The society is not dealing with general publics. So basically the same question, sir. Yeah, I think I have addressed it. With regard to mutuality, yes. I'll, I'll come again later. There is a separate issue yes. with regard to that. Yes, sir. Sir, one follow-on question on the basis of this issue. Uh, suppose assessing officers are following Todgars, and uh, should it not be restricted only to the dealing with nominal members rather than denying ATP2 entirely? Uh, question is not clear. Todgars does not discuss about nominal membership. Sorry, sir, the citizen, citizens. Yeah, yeah. No, see, if a cooperative society in Karnataka is dealing with nominal membership, citizens cooperatives decision of the Supreme Court is not at all applicable. But since a single officer has already pressed it, can we not state that only proportionate should be disallowed at least for stay proceedings, sir? Demand proceedings, sir. Ah, you can say that for stay proceedings, uh, you can say that, but it is not at all applicable should be the contention before the uh, in the stay application as well as before the appellate authorities. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, with regard to <clears throat> associate members also, there are few dispu disputes in the <clears throat> income tax arena. Under the Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act, associate membership is recognized, but there is a restriction. Number of associate members should not exceed 15% of the total regular membership. So if the total regular membership is 100, then associate members could, should not exceed 15. That is the meaning given as per the provisions of the Income Tax Act, sorry, Karnataka Cooperative Societies Act. Now, in many of the cases, the cooperative societies have enrolled quite a number of associate members and it has exceeded 15%. In all such cases, the income tax authorities have either disentitled the cooperative society from ATP deduction in entirety, or in some cases, they have disentitled the society from the deduction proportionately. However, if we see the decision of Bangalore ITAT in Atma Shakti Multipurpose Cooperative Society Limited, October 2019, it has followed the decision of citizens cooperative, which says that the business of the cooperative should be as per the provisions of the act. 
if a cooperative society is not doing the activities as per the Societies Act under which it is registered, then it is not entitled for ATP deduction. Following the footing of the Supreme Court, the Bangalore ITIT has passed this order disentitling the society from ATP deduction for the entire amount, not the proportionate amount. Further, Bangalore ITIT has also held in the case of Kanakadasa Patina Sahakari Sangha Niyamit in December 2019 and Sri Parvati Parmeshwar Patin Sahakar Sangha Niyamit in January 2021 on the same lines. <clears throat> Therefore, if a society has exceeded 15%, the possible solution is to get the number of membership reduced, but for the earlier years, it would be a challenge. However, one argument that could be raised is that it is only a technical or a venial breach and this breach should not lead to denial of deduction. Of course, this is a constitutional matter and may have to be appealed before the High Court and the Supreme Court to get a resolution, but until the tribunal level, getting the relief may be a challenge. One other reference I can give with uh, regard to this is in the Mavilais case, court has held that section ATP is a beneficial provision and should be interpreted liberally. So therefore, even if a society has exceeded 15% of the membership of associate members, it should still be entitled, could be a view we should persuade. Beyond this, I don't find any other way of arguing the case. I think there was a question with regard to associate membership, right? Yes, the 15% stands yeah. answered, sir. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. thank you. Sir. The next issue which has been haunting is filing of the returns by the due date. A new provision with effect from assessment year 2018-19 has been introduced. If the return of income is not filed by the due date, as mentioned in section 139.1, deduction is not available. The usual due date in the case of cooperative societies, which are not subject to audit, is July 31st, which has been extended this year. And in case of the societies which are subject to tax audit, is 31st October, <clears throat> which is also extended. So if a cooperative society has not filed its tax return within this specified due date, or in other words, even if it files a belated return, it is not entitled for the deduction. Here again, the argument against this kind of a disallowance could be that this is only a technical breach and should not be leading to denial of the benefit. There are quite a few decisions in the context of other sections or other <clears throat> acts wherein a small breach or a venial breach should not lead to the Deduction, the dissolvability of the deduction. So we should try to apply such decisions here and say that the venial breach should not lead to denial. Also, as I just mentioned, we should refer to the Supreme Court decision in Mavilai's case, wherein the court held ATP is a very beneficial provision and liberal interpretation has to be made. The other aspect, some of the friends with, uh, who have the clients where there has been belated return and who have been denied the deduction at section 80p is condonation possibility. Condonation provisions are not applicable under this existing instructions. They cover only cases of refund and carry forward of losses and they are not covered at the moment. Next issue is deduction for expenses under section 57. We just discussed that in the case a cooperative society is not getting the deduction under section ATP, then if the income is falling under section 56 as income from other sources, it should be entitled for deduction of expenses. Here, the, uh, there is an important decision of the Karnataka High Court, again in the case of Totras Cooperative Society in March 2015. It has held that when the income is considered under income from other sources, then only net income should be considered for the purpose of taxation. That's deduction of administrative expenses and expenses to earn said income should be made and thereafter the net income should be considered. 
one condition which is mentioned in section 57 clause 3 is deduction is allowable only if such expenditure is laid out or expended wholly and exclusively for earning that income. So here an excess has to be established for the purpose of getting the deduction. If a cooperative society has borrowed some funds and if the borrowed funds have been invested by way of deposits in some other bank, the interest which it is paying to the depositor will be deductible from the interest what it has been earning from deposits. So for this purpose, an excess has to be shown. Otherwise, the income tax authorities are denying the deduction. This is another issue which is coming up in the recent days. In such a case, a segmental profit and loss account should be maintained and proper document has to be kept so that an excess can be established. But still there will be a challenge to say that this particular fund has been invested for the purpose of earning the interest. It depends on facts and circumstances of each case and difficult to generalize the argument but try to keep segmental accounting and proper documentation to the extent possible. Next issue is with regard to mutuality principle. This is quite a complicated principle. This also has been analyzed by many of the courts. What are the main conditions for mutuality? Say mutuality in simple terms refers to a situation where a person cannot make profit out of himself. To make profit which is subject to tax, he has to deal with an outsider or a third party. If a person takes money from one of his pockets and puts it into another pocket of his own, he is not earning any income and is not liable for tax with the principal. What are the conditions of mutuality? There are mainly four conditions which have been identified by the high courts. Identity between contributors and beneficiaries and objective of mutual benefit and actual activities resulting in either mutual benefit or return of contribution to the contributors and impossibility of earning any profit from contribution made. So the last part is important. Impossibility of earning any profit from contribution made. So it is like a group of people sitting there and the money is being contributed by each one of them and that money is used for some purpose of mutual benefit and they are not making any income out of such money is considered to be a mutuality. In the case of citizens cooperative, one of the aspects which was discussed is mutuality. But apparently it appears that mutuality argument was raised as an alternative argument because section ATP is not directly connected to mutuality. Section ATP does not say that ATP deduction is available only in cases where the principle of mutuality is followed or only in cases where mutuality is applicable. It simply says that if the society is eligible for these, these conditions, then it is entitled for the benefit. Therefore, my view is ATP is not dependent on mutuality. Even if the income tax authorities say that your society is not uh, getting covered under the mutuality, you can still go ahead and claim ATP deduction. <laughs> However, in the case of housing societies, this mutuality principle is applied because I gave you an example of few people sitting and uh, collecting money and spending for mutual purpose. Similarly, in the case of resident welfare association, what is generally called as RWAs, or in the case of housing societies, this mutuality principle is applied. So in case of such societies, there is no requirement for that society to apply ATP deduction because the gross total income itself will be zero in such cases. There is no question of claiming deduction from gross total income. In one case before the Cochin ITAT, namely Hindalco Employees Cooperative Society in 2014, in the context of section 269 SS, that is uh, borrowing cash loans, etc., cash deposits or repayment of cash deposits, etc., the tribunal held that mutuality is not applicable in case of this particular society. So you need not be worried about the mutuality principle as long as your society's case gets covered under section ATP. 
in the context of demonetization there are two aspects i want to discuss one is unexplained cash credit etc the other one is deposit during demonetization period perhaps i can club these two and discuss together <clears throat> many of the cooperative societies during the demonetization period accepted cash currency notes that is specified bank notes or sbns from many of its members and they deposited such currency notes with the banks and they credited the account of the members of the equal amount so this was matter of dispute in the last year's assessments many of the assessing officers made additions under section 68 some of them made additions under section 69a unexplained cash credit or unexplained money <clears throat> the first argument in these cases is the identification details if they are given if the identification details of the members are given to the assessing officer then they should not come under the provisions of section 68 or 69a because it is not the unexplained money the members have been identified the members have given a confirmation where they have given the money to the society and such money has been deposited by the society into the bank and there is no question of unexplained money or unexplained cash credit it has been very well explained that should be the argument of course it is essential that you should have given all the details of the members and also confirmation from the members to the assessing officer if you haven't done that it will be a challenge in the appeals <laughs> further argument is demonetization notification restrict holding or transferring old currencies only from 31st december 2016 until then the there was no restriction for holding or transferring so it was not considered as illegal therefore the view that the currency notes which were accepted from the members was just a paper without any value is not correct that should be the other argument the further argument is even if any addition is made under section 68 or 69a deduction under section atp should be available because the argument is if there is any addition under section 68 or 69a the total the the gross total income will increase to that extent and section atp deduction is available from the gross total income and after deduction of gross total income the total income will be nil therefore there won't be a tax impact should be the argument to substantiate this in the context of a 68 addition there is a pune tribunal decision in aman chote vyapari in 2017 a very interesting decision one has to refer to that to claim the deduction in case of demonetization deposits one of the other arguments in the context of addition under section 68 69 or 69a 69b etc could be society does not have any other activity other than catering to the needs of the members and therefore addition is income from business and section 115 bb is applicable on total income but after applying section atp total income will be nil that should be the argument the other issue of litigation has been a general mandatory deduction under section atp to c while checking the provisions of the income tax act with regard to deduction we have seen that a general deduction of 1 lakh rupees will be available for a consumers cooperative society and 50000 rupees will be available for any other society here also the income tax officers have been taking a view that in cases where a society is covered under clause a or clause b of section atp 2 the deduction is not available but it is a general deduction whatever be the status of the cooperative society this general deduction up to the maximum of gross total income should be available there is a decision of the high court of gauhati in the case of industrial cooperative bank limited as well in this regard precisely covering this point so in case the assisting officer denies atp to c that's 1 lakh for consumer society or 50000 you should appeal that matter with the help of this high court decision of gauhati 
wherein it is told that it's a general deduction available to any kind of cooperative societies. The next issue of dispute is interest which has been received from the income tax refunds. The department has been taking a view that interest which is received has to be considered as income from other sources and fully taxable. There is a decision of the Pune ITIT in the case of Sant Motiram Maharaj Sahakari Patsamsta in September 2020, which says that if a credit cooperative society has received income tax refund and if it has received interest on such refund, that interest amount should also be subject to deduction under Section 80P2A1. It's also a very interesting decision in favor of the SSC. One important aspect is uh, while the assessments proceedings are on, most of the income tax officers do not accept the decision of ITATs of a different bench. But however, in the case of appeals before the commissioners or before the tribunals, the decisions of other tribunals are also very well accepted and appreciated. So sometimes you may have to lose in the assessment, but you will be able to win in the tribunal. The next issue of dispute is deduction under section, sorry, addition under section 40A1A. In case the taxes has not been deducted, then 30% of the amount which has been paid is considered as addition. Similarly, under 40A and 43B, there could be additions which are in the nature of a penalty. Even for them also, ATP deduction is allowable because such additions are going to be only additions to the gross total income and the entire gross total income will be deductible under section ATP if the required conditions are fulfilled. Here you can refer to the decision of Calcutta ITIT in the case of Gogat Thana Lahad Side Primary Cooperative Agricultural Marketing Society, November 2018. Also, there is an interesting circular of CBDT in 2016 in the context of section 80IB which says that if there is any addition under section 40A, IA or 43B, etc., the deduction at chapter 6A will get increased to that extent and it will be revenue neutral. You can rely on this decision even in the context of ATP. The last point of Issue, the last issue for discussion is deduction to cooperative, credit cooperative societies and the denial which is being done by the income tax officers under section ATP4. We have seen that section ATP4 is applicable only for cooperative banks. Despite that, many of the assessing officers consider cooperative credit societies as cooperative banks because the activities are almost the same. In such cases, we need to argue that cooperative societies and cooperative banks are different. Cooperative societies are not governed under the RBI Act, whereas cooperative banks are governed by the RBI. Cooperative banks are governed by the Banking Regulation Act, and therefore they are a different category altogether. Credit cooperative societies stand on a different footing. And also the argument should be ATP for should be applicable only to a cooperative bank and not to a cooperative society. If at all, the intention was to cover a credit cooperative society under ATP4, they would have very clearly mentioned. Also, they would have deleted clause one of ATP2A, which is squarely applicable for banking and credit cooperative societies activities. This should be the line of argument. In this regard, you can refer to the decision of Bangalore ITIT in Bangalore Commercial Transport Credit Corporate Society Limited, April 2011. Also, you can refer to the judgment of Supreme Court in Citizen, August 2017. It has been very elaborately discussed how a cooperative society is different from a cooperative bank. In the case of Citizens Cooperative Society, the society had collected a certificate from Reserve Bank of India saying that it is not a cooperative bank that came to its aid in the case of in in the case before supreme court so these are the 14 issues i thought that could be of relevance there could be many more issues 
but uh, may not be too significant is what I thought. Now, with regard to assessment and appeal, there are a few suggestions, very basic suggestions I thought let me make to my professional colleagues. The first suggestion is assessment is the foundation and the best opportunity. So submit all the documents and financial details and make all the alternative arguments. Also, you should submit a very detailed written submissions before the assessing officer so that he can appreciate. <clears throat> One important aspect you need to bear in mind is additional evidence in the case of any appeal before the commissioner appeals or before the income tax appellate tribunal will be a challenge because they do not entertain any additional document or say, for example, if you want to submit an affidavit or a statement of a third party or it could be a copy of a ledger statement, it may not be accepted at the appellate stage because there are specific rules. Rule 46A of the income tax rules specifies that a commissioner can entertain additional evidence only if there is a sufficient cause or if the income tax officer has not accepted submissions made by the, assess, uh, the assessee. Similarly, there are provisions in the income tax appellate tribunal rules, rule number 29. So, I request my professional colleagues to be cautious with regard to the submissions that are made before the assessing officer. Uh, we are coming to the last part of the discussion. If there are any questions, I would like to take them up. Yes, sir. I'll share my screen, sir, with your permission. So, with respect to 115 BBE subsection 2, will the deduction under ATP will still be allowable for uh, 6869 addition, sir? Uh, we discussed it. It should be allowable. Okay, sir. So, with respect to recognition of interest on a accrual basis, there are many cooperative societies which are not recognizing. So, any comments on this practice, sir, with respect to ATP? We need to now follow ICDS and uh, the uh, proper system has to be followed. We cannot say that we are following the hybrid system and that would be a challenge before the assessing officer. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Can the SSC, this is on associate membership, sir. Can SSC still argue that they have subsequently reduced the percentage below the 15% uh, or maybe before assessment proceedings and uh, claim that it is only a technical breach? We can claim that it's a technical breach, but the argument that we have reduced the members in the next sub or the subsequent years may not be a valid argument. We should argue that it is a technical breach, which should not lead to denial of the deduction. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, I'll read out this uh, full question in full. Whether the assessing officer can disallow under section ATP 2D uh, when the SSE has claimed deduction under ATP 2A clause 1 in the return of income. There is a follow-on question sir on this. Uh, assessing officer disallowed the profit portion instead of fully interest income. Whether the order drafted by assessing officer is valid, any grounds can be raised on this. Before the assessing officer, ideally, we need to claim the deduction of section ATP 2A1 and if it is interest or dividend from any other cooperative society, we should also claim under section ATP 2D. When the assessment order is passed, the assessing officer, if he wants to deny the benefit of ATP, he has to give the reasoning for both deduction under section ATP 2D and he has to give an explanation for ATP 2A1 as well. If he has, whatever be his reasoning or logic, I feel there is a very strong uh, ground for going in appeal. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. So, with respect to transferability of uh, shares of cooperative society, how will it affect concept of principle of mutuality? Concept of mutuality is not relevant in the case of societies other than housing societies or residential uh, uh, resident welfare association. So generally, we don't consider a cooperative society as uh, covered under the mutuality principle. Sure, sir. 
so with respect to intercorporate uh, intercorporate dividends. dividends it gets covered under section 80p2d as a dividend received from any other cooperative society and what we discussed for cop uh, interest from cooperative banks will hold good here as well perfect sir sir while calculating the cost of funds for claiming deduction under 57 what should be the last nail yeah this is an interesting question we discussed this there is no specified method a segmental accounting should be maintained and to the extent possible we should be able to show the nexus say for example if a cooperative society has been accepting deposits after deposits say it accepts 10 deposits per day you cannot say that that particular 10 deposits have been collected by it and thereafter it has been invested in some other cooperative society it will be too difficult to prove that and uh, generally we should we should go by the normal uh, irrational minds view saying that in case the funds have been collected then we need to pay the interest on that so how you can do is if a cooperative society has own funds as well as borrowed funds to the extent of own funds there is no question of cost of funds and to the extent of borrowed funds there is a cost involved you may not be able to show a direct relationship between deposit received and deposit made but you will be able to show the cost at least to the assessing officer you should argue on those lines thank you sir so last question is quite practical you have already commented on uh, mutuality sir but i'll still treat it eligibility of members of apmc is it controlled by government or members if it is controlled by government where is the concept of mutuality APMC I am not aware because it's a separate act altogether who can become a member of the APMC I am not very sure I'm not able to comment on this because it's not covered under the cooperative societies act or under the income tax act sure sir thank you sir so last question sir if a credit cooperative society having a complex give it on rent can it claim ATP 2C yeah it rent would be covered under ATP 2C So I think with this we have exhausted all questions, sir. So with your permission, uh, can we share the recording of this session as well as PPT with all the members on KSA website, sir? Yeah, you can do that. I would like to thank the KSAA, the ever enthusiastic young team of KSAA, and all the office bearers. Also, I would like to thank the audience. We are on time. It is six four now. We have successfully completed this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was very nice, sir. Many we have got a lot of good feedbacks in the chat box. Uh, thanks to you, sir. I would request uh, C. A. Pankaj to give formal word of thanks. Sir, Balaji, sir, will take over. Yes, sir. yes. May I request Balaji, sir? Sir, yes, sir. It was indeed really great listening to C. A. Pankaj, sir. I am pretty sure that the knowledge we gained today will guide us in dealing with ATP deduction for societies. C.A. Prakash sir, I thank you for accepting our request and sharing your knowledge on the subject ATP deduction. I thank KSA A President C.A. Kumar S. Jigajini and DT Committee Chairman C.A. Siddesh, Mafizil Committee Chairman C.A. Pankaj Kasat, and Team K.S. KSA A. I would also like to thank our Media and Technology Committee Chairman C.A. Vinayak Bhat and his team. my special thanks to today attendee for taking out your valuable time for this webinar and your patience listening thank you one and all thank you